this has been a sermon probably over the last 10 years or so that's been um, in my mind. It, it wasn't written until uh, 10 minutes ago, but, uh, and then printed, printed out for you. The, uh, I've got four children, if you don't know me, I grew, grew up here, um, learned how to drive in the church parking lot, much like I taught most of my kids. But um, over the four children, uh, my wife and I, when we got married, there were some agreements made. And one of those agreements uh, is that she would raise our children and I would teach them how to drive. <laughs> and that, uh, I have found, has been about equal. Uh, and as you'll see uh, in today's sermon, you'll, you'll hear why. Um, she is in North Carolina for her monthly week and a half trip visiting the grandkids with, without me. And um, so she can't object to the stories I'm about to share of her and the kids and one of me, of course, to be fair. So. Uh, I, I start this with, uh, if you want to learn how to pray, teach children how to drive. I d <laughs> you, you'll learn a little bit of how, at least I taught my kids how to drive. You be the judge by the end of the sermon whether I was successful or not uh, on that. But I, I feel some of the closest times that I was to God was actually sitting in a passenger seat <laughs> with a 15-year-old driving a 4,000-pound missile on 71 at 70 miles an hour. So that's, we don't start there, but we ended there uh, for sure. So to help you understand that the kids were just as grateful that dad was the instructor, uh, I'm gonna share the one and only story of Shannon that she uh, knows that I'm gonna tell. I could tell hundreds of stories over the 32 years that we've been married. But this will just give you a small, this is a good story, clean story, it's not bad at all uh, on her. Uh, it's something we laugh about still uh, today. but. It's a small glimpse into why I became the instructor for the four kids. So if you can imagine, for those of you familiar with Mansfield, they are coming south on Tremble Road. They are headed towards Marion. Uh, Shannon is the passenger. Uh, she's still the driver, but she's the passenger. And Jill, her best friend, is driving, and she's on the phone with her daughter. So I know that's a distraction. I know that's not a good thing to be. But in this uh, particular story a few months ago, Jill and Shannon, south on Tremble Road, Jill's on the phone. And Jill turns on the blinker for Marion Avenue to come into Home Road and into Lex Spring Mill and come into Lexington. Shannon, because she's the passenger, gets her attention and says, and Jill knows that that means go straight or you're going to be in trouble. So she turns off the blinker, heads, continues on Trumbull Road to Cook Road. At this point, Jill's still on the phone, but she looks at Shannon to get permission. <laughs> Shannon says, thumbs up, turns on the blinker. They turn on to Cook Road. They go down Cook Road over the hills and far away and around the corner. And up in the distance is a construction worker with a stop sign. Heavy equipment, culvert repair, pavement, something's going on that they've got to stop traffic for a few minutes. By this point, Jill has gotten off the phone and minutes have turned into more minutes. And Jill kind of looks at Shannon with those eyes that you look at. And Shannon goes, guess you should have taken Marion. So that's the one clean story I can tell of Shannon and her uh, passenger seat driving. So each of these three points, hopefully you've got a cheat sheet uh, in your bulletin. Uh, each of these three points, I want to set context of a driving story, per se, or something that happened during the driving. And it gave me time to think about my walk with God or w my Christian life. And I'm hoping that these three, three and a half points will help you in some way as well as you leave this uh, service today and, and go about your life that you'll remember maybe some of these stories and how, it, how I felt it connected with my walk in Christ. So the first one is serving God with a purpose. It gave me a lot of time to think about uh, plans and purpose. To give you a little bit of context, if you have not taught children how to drive, this is at least how I did it. I'm not saying it's correct. You'll probably wonder if I did it correctly by the end of the sermon uh, based on the stories that you hear. But for me, we would start in the church parking lot, teach them uh, empty parking lot for the most part, yellow lines, parking, coming, going, reverse, driving forward, reverse. And that took up about 10 minutes. And I would look at my watch and I would think, wow, the state of Ohio requires 50 hours of this. 50 hours, 10 of those at night. So not only do I get to risk my life in broad daylight, 10 of those hours, I will be praying to God that it's not raining or snowing or icy uh, in the darkness of night. So 15 minutes of practicing parking. It's not parallel parking. That's one of my least favorite, but it's at least parking. At some point, we gather up enough charisma to get out of the parking lot, cross Delaware Avenue into the car wash. 
If he can do that successfully, and I still, I'm still alive, we'll try a country road. So we're probably a half hour in. I have enough confidence that he is not going to kill me. And we head down 42 South. And that is more, more than likely the four kids. That's the beginning path. But there are 50 hours of this. 200 hours between four kids. If you stretch that in, out into work weeks, that is five weeks of 40-hour weeks. So five weeks of my life praying to God. How many cities can you drive to? How many country roads can you explore? How many highways can you go 70 miles an hour and eat up 50 hours? Just to give you context, if you're not from here, Ontario is a common destination. It's 15 minutes from our house. It's 15 minutes back to our house. There's a half hour. I now have 49 and a half hours. <laughs> Mount Vernon, you say? Great. That's a half hour down, half hour back. I now have 48 and a half hours. Columbus, down to Columbus and back. I still have over 46 hours of this. And that's just one kid. I have twins, so there was 100 hours. We'll get to that in a minute. But I did realize in this idea of not having a purpose or a plan, I began realizing if we don't have a destination, it is the most mind-numbing, excruciating uh, trip. It could be a 10-minute trip, and it seems like four hours. And I legally couldn't put four hours on the card that I get notarized, but it felt like four hours. If you do not have a goal, there's no success. If you don't have a destination, there's no sense of arrival, no sense of accomplishment. And it's a constant, are we there yet? One of the books I was reading in the last 10 years that uh, had a, a chapter on focus, uh, Mark Sanborn uh, is a Christian and he's also a, a prolific uh, author, but uh, you don't need a title to be a leader. And in this book, is, uh, he has a chapter on focus. Now, it's not the chapter itself that uh, was interesting to me. He actually references another title, but I want you to understand that this is how I felt just about every time one of our kids would get in and say, where are we going today? He quotes David Campbell. He gives the title of the book. David Campbell wrote a very clever book called, <clears throat> If You Don't Know Where You're Going, You'll Probably End Up Somewhere Else. <laughs> so that's how I felt of the four kids. If you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. So are we serving God aimlessly when we come to church, when we help out in the nursery, when we do kids' own worship, when we give communion, when we preach when we teach in Sunday school when we help at mosaic are we doing it with a purpose or are we just driving aimlessly on our path with Christ do we come to church because our parents did do we come to church because we felt that our parents made us come to church I apologize I hate to read to you but there's a couple of paragraphs here that uh, say it better than I and I want you to see that uh, teaching kids how to drive there's also something similar and getting your pilot's license. Bob Goff is a Christian and a prolific writer as well. He's uh, friends with Donald Miller. Uh, Scott and Francis Williams out in Idaho uh, first got me introduced to Donald Miller's books, uh, very interesting reads, and then he's uh, good friends with Bob Goff, so I've read uh, a few of his books. In this idea of dreaming big, know what you want, why you want it, and what you're going to do about it. Uh, in this book, there is a section that he discusses his pilot's license. We have a, a person with a pilot's license here, so I hope this is true, or I'm going to hear about it after the sermon. But bear with me, it's, it's a few paragraphs, but I think this will help drive home the point of having a purpose or a plan. One of the last things they taught me when I was training to get my pilot's license is how to respond when the engine stops mid-flight. That got my attention. Here's what they had me do. We flew a few thousand feet up in the air, then practiced cutting the power to the engines. Before we did, though, I looked at the instructor in the co-pilot seat and asked, are you sure you want me to do this, right? <laughs> Believe me, it's more than a little unsettling to pull back all of the power from the engine. If you're like me, the whir of the engines can be a little annoying, but far worse is complete silence. In that moment, you realize a really good airplane just turned into a really bad glider. When the engine fails, they teach you the process, pitch, pick, point. Pitching means you push the controls to the plane forward and pitch it towards the ground. Doing this takes carving that new groove in your brain we've been talking about previously in the book because when the propeller stops spinning, the earth doesn't feel like your friend anymore. If you go with your instincts, you want to pull back on the flight controls, but something worse will actually happen. You'll stall out and crash for sure. The second thing you do is pick where you're going to land. It can be a field or a road or a parking lot. The idea is to pick something, anything, 
other than a body of water or herd of cattle. If you don't pick, if you don't pick anywhere, you'll lose the opportunity to influence the outcome. Let me read that again. If you don't pick anywhere, you lose the opportunity to influence the outcome. The same is true in our lives. The last thing to do after pitching forward and picking a landing spot is to keep pointing at what you picked. It sounds simple enough, but in flying and in life, it's easy to get distracted. We're all prone to wander. Rather than pointing at beautiful, truthful things, we sometimes point tar toward dark ones or ones that are merely entertaining. Paul talked about fixing our eyes on Jesus. Certainly do this, and as you do, notice all the beautiful ambitions of yours that are adjacent to his will. If we don't, instead of pointing at things that will be lasting and purposeful, we settle for things that merely work or are easily available. I may land in a cornfield, but what I've learned from flying is that instead of picking everything and aiming at nothing, I need to pick something worth pointing all of my energies at. Once I do, I don't take my eyes off of it, and I keep pointing at it in the best or worst of circumstances. So this idea of serving God with purpose, with a plan, not aimlessly, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. So that is just a short glimpse of one of the three things that I would sit and ponder as we would drive aimlessly around Ohio for 200 hours. Did we have a purpose? Do we have a plan? When I serve God, do I have a purpose? Number two, if you're filling in along the cheat sheet, obeying God, I began to think about uh, laws in a different way here, obeying God. So uh, in context, a little story. So uh, as I did with the other th uh, three kids, Owen, my youngest, we started here in the church parking lot like we've done before. We go over to the car wash and come back several times. We survive that. On down 42 we go. We get into the countryside and most of those speed limits are, uh, goes from 35 to 45 to 50. And I'm not sure why he's the only one that did this, but he could not get that car up to speed. And I'm looking at my watch thinking, okay, we've got 50 hours, but that doesn't mean you do 20 miles an hour on country roads. This is ridiculous. And I, I thought at one time an Amish buggy passed us. It was crazy. Now, of course, I'm kidding. It was just a bicycle. <laughs> but for the first couple hours, if it was 35 in town, he did 20. If it was 45 in the country, he did 30. He just could not conceptualize that the speed limit was where he was supposed to get to. So I finally had a conversation with him. He, he slowly got up to the speed limit. He did pass his test. But it allowed me to wonder for just a small period of time, is he not doing the speed limit on his own free will? Is he choosing to drive slower than the speed limit? Maybe he's comfortable in that speed range. Maybe he just doesn't know what's, how to drive a car. Maybe I've not done good enough in the parking lot. Or is he driving under the speed limit because his father is sitting beside him in the passenger seat and he's fearful that the father's going to say something or yell at him or correct him in some way. He, he sometimes doesn't like to be corrected. He, he, he's stubborn like me and wants to forge his own path. So I began to wonder in my Christian walk, do I drive slower than the speed limit? Do I, do I do things where I'm obeying the law out of fear? Or am I obeying law, the law because I love God and want to um, respect the law? Is God sitting beside me as I go through life? Am I, am I fearful while I'm obeying him? Or is he forcing me in some way because he's sitting there and that's a cloud over my judgment, right? Are we obeying God out of our free will or because he says so? In Romans, Paul says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I love God's law. 
But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this physical body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So I begin thinking about those things, this law, the consequences, the free will that I have to either choose to obey the law, obey God, or do I feel like God is sitting there like I was with my son and I obey the law out of some type of fear that God's going to be upset. So I've told a story of Shanna, I've told a story of my youngest, so I'll share one now that, that uh, drives us into part two of this obeying the law, obeying God, right? So uh, at this point in the story, I'm a police officer in Ontario uh, for many years, but I'm off duty. I'm uh, minding my own business on Millsboro Road between home and Tremble. It's supposedly 35 miles an hour. It is one of three places that I have uh, difficulty driving the speed limit. I don't know if you've seen Millsboro Road. It looks like a country road, and you're supposed to drive fast. It's straight. I don't know what the problem is until I got pulled over by a trooper, and he thought I was speeding. Uh, must have been. So I pull into a driveway, shut off the engine, put my hands on the steering wheels, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Get off the road, make it safe, so the officer's not, not afraid. Comes up to the window, knocks on the glass. License. I must inform you, because it's my duty that I have an off-duty weapon in my car. Are you an officer? Yes, I'm off-duty from Ontario Police. I still need your license. Dang it. <laughs> I must have been going at least 40 then. I don't know what's going on. So I give, him the, I give him my license, and he goes back to the car. Now I'm contemplating all the consequences. A ticket, my wife laughing at me. I, do I contest it? Do I really want to go to court? Do I just pay the, the ticket? He comes back and just says, slow it down and walks away. He's probably upset he didn't get a ticket for the day, but uh, officers do pull other officers over and it becomes awkward at a point. But for this purpose today, when I drive down Millsboro Road, quite often as I do, I now try to do 35. And it reminds me, every time I'm on that road, I drive past the driveway and it reminds me of the warning that I got. And I begin to contemplate, am I obeying the speed limit because I'm fearful of the state trooper? <coughs> Or do I follow the speed limit because I love rules and laws and I love the benefits that those rules and laws give me, like not being late to my appointment, not getting pulled over, not getting a ticket, not being embarrassed. So there, if you follow God's law, if you obey God out of love, there shouldn't be any fear of consequences. It, be, it brings a freedom. And I hope that in my teaching of my children that I was at least imparting on them that as I told them about man's laws on the road and speed limits and so forth, that they should follow those rules and laws for the benefits, not because there's consequences. Another example that I can give you of following the law because I feared the consequences. As an officer, I would get dressed in uniform and then head to work. I lived in Lexington, worked in Ontario, so that would give me an opportunity every day to travel Lex Spring Mill, another uh, road that's hard to do 35. But I would eventually end up in Ontario, four lanes, two lanes going north, two lanes going south. And in my uniform and in my rush to get to work, I would pass cars because they're just going too slow. But then I would see them looking at me in my uniform and I would immediately realize, wait a minute, I'm not setting the best example. They see me as an officer. I'm going over the speed limit. So I would slow down. And that would make me think, am I slowing down because I'm fearful of the embarrassment or being called out for speeding or the consequences of getting a ticket? Or am I slowing down because I love the law and I should be an example? I should be a mentor. I shouldn't cause anybody to stumble. The question really becomes on that two-lane road and there's nobody there. Do I do the speed limit even when nobody's looking? Do I have integrity and character to continue to follow the laws when nobody can make me feel guilty. And 1 Corinthians brings it home to me on this point. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church. And there I am in uniform, supposedly enforcing laws, setting an example for others. Did I cause anyone to stumble? Did how I instruct my children in how to drive, am I causing them in some way to stumble if I don't teach them correctly? 
Number three, if you're following along and filling in, give you the context of sharing God with responsibility. So the, the story here is not necessarily a driving story yet, but we want to give some context that while we're driving at some point, we would uh, turn the radio on and I would try to teach them about distractions and not changing the radio station unless you're at a stop sign or a stoplight. But we would, uh, the, the silence at about my hour 48 or 47, the silence is deafening, right? You do everything you can, you finally turn the radio on. But over time, a particular song or band would come on and I'd quickly change the channel. And I apologize if you've heard the story before, but uh, for those that have not, uh, we have to set some context here. And it was usually a song by the band Aerosmith. They come out of the 70s. Uh, of course, uh, some of my friends have discussed that there was no music after the 70s. Some would say after the 60s. But uh, just know that my dad introduced me to Pink Floyd, Aerosmith, The Beatles, Steve Miller Band, those type of, of groups. At the same time, when I was 12 or 13, I was baptized here in this church. And uh, across America in the 80s, they were burning these albums. Apparently Black Sabbath, ACDC, they apparently didn't sing Christian lyrics and the churches were burning these albums. So I've, I'm conflicted. How, how can my, my father listen to these bands? How can I not enjoy this music as a 12 year old, right? So uh, fast forward a year or so and we're out on the golf course. And I was just a young man, couldn't afford a set of golf clubs. Have you seen the price, price on those? And my mother had a set of ladies' clubs that were the right height for me, and I would borrow her clubs, and my dad would take me out golfing. So one Sunday afternoon, we're out on the golf course, probably hole three, and uh, we're up towards the green. I pull my nine iron, a putter out of the bag, and walk away from the golf cart, and I chip onto the green, and I then putt out like you should and go back to the golf cart, and we go off to hole number four. About hole five or six, I realize my nine iron is missing, and it's not my nine iron, it's my mother's. And what am I gonna tell my mother if I go home and she's missing a club, and we can't afford to buy a new set of golf clubs, and I don't know how to buy a spare club at Goodwill, and blah, 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 and my mind is now racing to the point where I promise to God, I swear an oath, which is a whole other set of sermons that we could talk about, but as a young kid, I thought this is how we get God to do things. It's not. Uh, but uh, I swear an oath to God that, Lord, if somehow this club appears in the bag by the time we're done golfing, I will stop listening to, and I run several bands through my head, and I pick Aerosmith. I will never listen to Aerosmith again. That was my way of burning records. I kid you not. Up comes this golf cart up over the hill, waving a golf club. Is this yours? Is this yours? I wanted to say, thanks, God, I found it. But of course, I've kept my word. I, if Steven Tyler's on American Idol, if Aerosmith comes on the radio, we change the channel. It gave a chance for me to talk to my kids about God, sharing God responsibly. To this day, if we're in the car and Aerosmith comes on, they say, Dad, you're going to change it? You're going to change it? The problem becomes when you step into an elevator and it's that Muzak that they've converted. Do I get off the elevator? Do I ride the elevator? Do I have a choice? The other side of sharing God responsibly, that, that's one way to share God, right? Uh, create uh, situations where you can share the, the gospel message. But and on a more serious note, when you're teaching kids how to drive, who's responsible in an accident? Am I responsible because I'm the valid licensed driver sitting in the passenger seat? Is my child responsible if they cause an accident because they're the ones controlling the 4,000 pound vehicle? Are we both responsible? I have a set of twins that caused 100 hours of driving in one summer. Evan gets the first story here. We are uh, headed to Ontario because you have to have a plan. You have to have a purpose. We're probably at hour 40 uh, going backwards to zero. And at some point, I'm not saying this is good, but at some point I would stop saying ahead of time, turn left, turn right, go straight because that would alert them, ooh, there must be something changing ahead, a stop sign, a stoplight, something's happening. So I would slowly not tell them which way to turn. Plus, they've got to learn how to get places, right? We didn't have GPS. Atlas, turn the, turn the page, right? So this was one of those days. I'm not going to say a word. 
and I feel the vehicle slowing down. We're on Shearwood, headed towards Lex, Ontario. We're headed to Ontario. So in my mind, he can go straight, he can go left. If he goes right, I'm going to have to say something, because then we're heading back into Lexington, and we don't know our purpose. So I feel the vehicle slowing down. Evan's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. My youngest, Owen, is learning uh, what he's going to have to look at uh, in a few years, but he's in the back seat. So I've got two family members that now I'm responsible for. I feel the vehicle slowing down. I haven't had to say left or right or straight. And I can hear him beginning to uh, contemplate. He's uh, under his breath. Okay, if I go straight, I could turn left on Plymouth. If I turn left, I could turn right on Cockley. Oh my gosh, left, straight, left, straight. All of a sudden, he accelerates right through the stop sign, turns left, and I look in the rearview mirror, and there's a car directly behind us. Thankfully, nobody's hurt. Nobody ran into each other. Thankfully, they did not blow their horn. I tried to wave my hand as though it was not my fault. They didn't wave back with all five fingers. <laughs> Once we established our lane and calmed down, I asked, what's going on? What did you do? I thought you saw the stop sign. He goes, I did. Earlier, but then I, but then I started thinking, left, straight, left, straight. And I got so focused, I made a decision and thought, let's go. <laughs> but whose fault would it have been? Would it have been my fault because I'm the teacher? Would it have been his fault because he's the one controlling the car? When I stand up here and preach, when I teach at Sunday school, am I responsible for what I share with you? When you leave this congregation, is there any responsibility on you to read the Bible and to check what I'm saying and to question for yourself, is this what the Bible teaches about serving God, obeying God, or whatever the topic is? And for how long is that responsibility? If we go 10 years from now, am I still responsible today what I impart to you? Or is that responsibility, uh, responsibility just on you? And I, I give the other two stories here to hopefully bring home this point. So the first two stories, Owen driving under the speed limit, Evan almost causing an accident by driving through a stop sign. Those were all while they had a permit. I'm the valid driver in the passenger seat. They were on a permit. Who's responsible? These next two stories, these are after my uh, other two kids passed their test. All four kids did pass their test the first time. I'm not saying they're great drivers, but they did pass their test. But I want you to contemplate, is Adam the father in this example, is he still responsible once his kids get their license? I start with Morgan, our oldest daughter. In this story, she's uh, married, living in North Carolina, which is still true. And uh, her and her husband and uh, two friends are in Morgan's car going downtown Fayetteville to go to dinner. Uh, there may have been a concert in there as well, but the, the crux of the story is Morgan's driving, Chris is in the passenger seat. They see a spot up ahead along the busy road near the restaurant in between parked cars, and now we enter the parallel parking dilemma. <laughs> now, I will admit I left most of that to the driving instructor that we paid hundreds of dollars for, but I still assume some responsibility because I had to at least try to teach them, right? But So Morgan tries, she backs up, doesn't get it, pulls forward, backs up again, doesn't get it. There's four or five times of this. The husband then starts to interject and give his instruction, which doesn't help at all. I, I, I can attest to that in my own life, right? When the passenger is driving the car. Well, one of the things I did pass on to my kids was stubbornness. And uh, in, in her stubbornness, and she'll admit this if she was telling the story, she just put that in reverse and backed into that spot. And by golly, she made it with a tree branch stuck into the side of the car door. <laughs> Apparently, they plant trees really close to the curb in downtown Fayetteville, and it was crammed into the crease of the door bad enough that they couldn't even get out of the car in the back seat. Chris, my son-in-law, finally gets out of the car, trades places with Morgan, slowly pulls it forward, slowly backs it right in, just like you're supposed to do. I'm not sure how long it took before Chris and Morgan talked again, but <laughs> it can be done, and the only harm was a very small dent on the back of the car. But am I responsible in some small way. This is years after I taught her how to drive. This is years after she passed her license. But in some small way, I feel responsible. Could I have done a better job? But this is years later. The other story, uh, the, the final kid story, uh, Ian, the other twin, he has his license at this point in the story. I feel I've done great. In fact, I trust him enough I'm at work. We have a car down at a garage in Lexington that's being worked on. I have a part in the garage that the mechanic needs. So I text my son, Ian, hey buddy, could you run this part that's in the garage down to the mechanics on the other side of Lexington? Sure, dad. 
A little while later, I get a text. Hey, uh, having trouble backing out of the garage. That's weird. Uh, it seems to be a, a piece of wood behind the front wheels, and I put it in reverse, and I can't get over the piece of wood. It's, it's causing the wheels to lock up. I said, just give it some gas. But then I started thinking, wait a minute. I didn't have any two-by-fours or anything laying in the garage. Why would he be having trouble getting out? Hmm. I then get this picture. I see the problem. <laughs> hmm. He's okay. We needed a new garage door anyway. <laughs> but I see the piece of wood now that's causing the problem. So I, <laughs> at this point, we're on the phone talking because texting, it just becomes a, a moot point at that, right? He, so we're on the phone. I said, what happened, buddy? He said, well, I know you taught me what the brake pedal is and what the gas pedal is, but in my haste, I was parked at the bottom of the driveway, which is not very long, and I didn't want to carry this big, heavy gas tank all the way to the Jeep, so I thought I'd pull up to the garage. And what I thought I was pressing on the brake apparently was the gas pedal. So I told him, just give it a lot of gas, back it out of there. It actually did not do any damage to that Jeep. A paint, a paint mark was left over. And we got a new garage door. The siblings were not happy that he was not in trouble because, again, I felt responsible. I taught him how to drive. I asked him to take a part down to the mechanic's garage. So how much time passes where you are not responsible for what you teach or preach or share or instruct in? Who is responsible for their walk in Christ? Is it me, the preacher? Is it you, the person who should study the Bible and make sure that I'm teaching correctly? In James, James writes, not many of you should become teachers. Maybe I should listen to that. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. I hope that I've raised my kids in a Christian household. I hope that my kids, uh, through uh, hopefully in some way me instructing them how to drive, that they want to serve God, not feeling that they have to. I, I hope that I've imparted on my kids that when they obey God, that they, they do it out of love. They don't do it out of fear of the consequences. I hope that uh, they share God responsibly with others. And I think every day now, as my wife is in North Carolina with our grandkids, have I shared enough with my kids that they will share God responsibly with their kids? What, what are they imparting upon my grandkids? How long does that responsibility last of the Father? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your wisdom and guidance. Lord, we, we read what you've given us in the word, and we know that we can serve you in love, we can obey you in love, we can share you responsibly, that we should not live in fear, we should not be anxious, we should not be um, burdened with all of these things around us, Lord. In love, we know that we have freedom, the benefits that are there, that, that we can... Uh, experience life as you've wanted us to experience uh, through serving and obeying and sharing you in Lord, uh, in love, Lord. We uh, lift all of these praises, prayer requests, unspoken prayers, Lord, up to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.